for that conversation. We'll we'll uh we'll go into it more in uh after Jeff speaks. So forward marketing with Heather, da da da. So she's been utilizing this whole time to make Pivo, right? So that has been our <coughs> for the last two plus years, probably make probably even longer, right? And a lot of people use like Jasmine, for example, uses Pink Hippo independently, right? So and so forth. So they do have graphic people there, graphics people, and obviously they print. But due to now, and I'm going to say this, right? We're here, especially as we're going into shifting market, we want to be as cognizant of your pocketbook as possible, right? So there's not going to be any padding on the prices that you get. And, and Pink Hippo has given us an incredible discount to be able to uh, make uh, your mailings, your print jobs, so on and so forth, very um, uh, cost-effective, if you will, and they do a great job. So I just wanted to share that with you, so on and so forth. We'll circle back on that conversation in just a little bit. Sound good? And here, here hell yeah? Okay. okay, perfect. Okay, welcome to the KW family. Tony, Fernando is here. Where did he go? There you are. Welcome, welcome, Artine and uh, Coralie. Right? It doesn't look like that. So uh, she, I, we teased each other about it. So anyway, so welcome to the KW family. We had uh, ten new agents come in in the month of November. So super excited. Congratulations and welcome, and excited to have you a part of us. Remember, Ignite uh, is daily. The next one is tomorrow at 10 a.m., session 15, when the seller. Holiday office hours, real quick. Thursday, we're closing at four, just so we can make sure that we have it decorated and ready to go for you. Friday the 23rd, this is new news to the staff, so they'll be super happy. Friday the 23rd and Monday the 26th, the offices are closed. Okay, 12, 1230 um, uh, is closing at three. And then January 2nd is actually a holiday, a federal or a national holiday, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're closed that day as well. So that's the holiday schedule just to give you a little uh, update on that. Please tell me Jeff next. No, Coke Drive. Thank you so much. Everybody has brought so many. I, I'm so pleased and I'm going to be delivering them um, next week to Ventura County on um, Delta where they're going to distribute them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Success. Yeah. Thanks for everyone bringing your coats in. All right. Finally, <laughs> Jeff Pawn, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, we always appreciate all your insight. He's going to be talking about new forms and risk management, so on and so forth. So super excited to hear everything that you want to share. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Rich. Um, I'm going to try to uh, screen share if I can. Let's see if I can, first of all. Uh, you need to make me, somebody needs to make me a co-host, please. So advanced sharing. And while we're working on that, um, I'm going to cover the uh, forms release December 20th, next Tuesday, uh, is your Christmas present from uh, CAR, I guess. They're releasing new forms and revised forms on December 20th, next next Tuesday, I believe. Uh, so today we're going to cover not all the new and revised forms, but the major ones, the major changes. Um, if you want to see those now, all you have to do is go to car.org, and under the Standard Forms tab, uh, you will see a summary of all the changes. There's like a five-page summary that has all the, the rev revisions and all the new forms, and then you can see all the revisions and new forms in their final draft form. Uh, so you can see everything now before they come out next week. So let's see if I'm able to screen share now. Okay, tell me if you can see the California Residential Purchase Agreement on your screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's what we're going to cover first. Uh, so I'm first I'm going to go through the changes to the purchase agreement, then I'm going to do the revised forms, and then I'm going to do the new forms. I was on the, or I am on the committee this year. I've been on the committee for many, many years. I'm on the committee next year. So as we're going through the forms, I can tell you what the committee may or may not have been thinking. And I'll tell you a few times where I was outvoted and uh, they came up with stuff that I'm not that crazy about, but you, you got what you got. So uh, with that, we're going to start with the California Residential Purchase Agreement. The good news is 
Obviously, there's no major change to the form since the form was just changed. The major changes were last year. Hopefully, you're all kind of up to date now on the on the new kind of new purchase agreement. But we got, I would say, we got over a thousand comments between last year and now from people, you know, from agents and uh, others uh, about things they wanted changed or whatever. So we adapted or adopted some of those, not all of them, but some of them. And I'm going to go through the major ones as we go through the purchase agreement now. So the first change of any significance is down here where you can see in red, uh, it says buyer to pay blank points to obtain the rate above. And by the way, as I'm going through the forms, Stephanie or Rich or whoever, whoever is there, uh, if you could check the chat, if there's any questions uh, as I get to the end of each form uh, that I do, I'll be happy to answer questions as opposed to waiting till the end because otherwise people might forget about their questions. So feel free to check the chat and just interrupt me as I finish a form. So the first change here on the purchase agreement is where it says buyer to pay blank points. It used to default and it used to say buyer to pay zero points. Uh, the committee looked at that and felt like, well, that didn't make any sense because what happens if the buyer had to pay a half a point or a point, they could have used that as a way to get out of the contract. So we eliminated the zero points and now both the interest rate and the points are blank and you have to fill those in. So if you're a buyer's agent, it's very important to fill that in. We see a lot of contracts that are left blank here where the interest rate isn't filled in and the, the points aren't filled in. And think about that. If you don't fill that in and the buyer can get a loan, but the loan is way higher than the buyer wanted to pay interest rate wise or point wise, the seller can say, well, you didn't, you didn't put any kind of a cap on it. If you can get a loan, I don't care what the interest rate is or the points are, you're stuck. So to avoid that, you need to fill this out at the time of the offer. So you can fill in whatever, uh, whether it be, you know, a couple of months ago, I was saying, you know, fill in three and a half percent interest rate, now probably 7% or whatever. Uh, but you need to fill in an interest rate and, and points. The points you could fill in like maybe one and a half. That's pretty standard. And on the interest rate, you usually write about a half a percent above the going rate. And that way, your buyer knows that if the rate is going to be higher than that or the points are going to be higher, they have a way to legitimately get out where the seller really doesn't have an argument to complain about it. But if you leave it blank, the seller could argue that, hey, you can qualify for 10%. And that's what the rate went to. So I'm not giving you your deposit back. So it's very important that you fill it out. It's also important for the seller to have it filled out because then the seller knows what the buyer is willing to do and not willing to do. So unfortunately, we see this left blank way too often. So I'm just reminding you that you really, really should fill this out uh, when you're writing the offer. And if it comes to you as a seller and a listing agent, you should counter in terms as well. Jack, so that's the question. Go ahead. So um, the rate is typically not locked at this point. So what if the buyer goes to lock the rate and it's higher than what's in the contract, is there any risk to that? Well, the, the contract says what the buyer is willing to pay max. So let's say you cleared it for seven and it goes up to seven and a half. If the buyer's willing to pay above that, it's not going to be a problem. But if the buyer's not willing to pay, then they'd have a, a way to get out of the contract. But the, the seller's not going to be able to say, well, the seller's not going to be in a position to say, well, you cleared for seven and now you're willing to pay eight, so I'm canceling on you. You know, the buyer's always able to pay more. It's just that that gives them an out if they don't want to pay more. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So the next change of any significance is under G3. This one is really kind of controversial and I was I'm not a fan of this but I'm going to tell you what it is and then I'm going to follow up a little bit later with a form but you all know that in an offer the buyer's agent can't ask the listing agent to pay more money in commission that's that's an MLS violation but there's the all oh, you've probably heard about all these lawsuits going on now with the DOJ and NAR and problems with uh, MLSs and the offer of compensation and buyer broker agreements we're going we're to talk about. So the committee came up with a way that the buyer, a buyer who signs a buyer broker agreement, let's say a buyer signs a buyer broker agreement. By the way, we're going to cover that in a little bit. And in the buyer broker agreement, the the um, the buyer agrees to pay the buyer's broker, let's say two and a half percent. And then in the MLS, the commission is only two percent, let's say, to the buyer's agent. And so the buyer wants to try to get the seller, not the listing agent, but the seller to pay the difference. So under G3, it says seller agrees to pay the obligation of buyer to compensate buyer's broker under a separate agreement, which is the uh, buyer broker agreement. So 
you could, it's, it's not the buyer's agent asking the listing agent to pay a higher commission. That's still an MLS violation. This would be asking the seller uh, to pay the additional amount between what the buyer agreed to pay under the buyer representation agreement and what was listed in the MLS. So save any questions on this for later because we're going to cover the forms. But I just want to make you aware that this is here. If there isn't a buyer broker agreement involved, then you would not use G3 because there would no, be no reason to use G3 unless you're trying to recover money from a buyer broker agreement. So save any questions on that one for a little bit later. We'll cover it a little later. Um, and I'm not going to cover all the red stuff, just like the major stuff. We go down to M3. And the importance here is to remind everybody that you have to use a TOPA form, a tenant occupied property form. If there's a tenant in the property, uh, the buyer and the buyer's agent should be using a TOPA if they know that the property is tenant occupied, but sometimes the buyer and the buyer's agent don't know the property is tenant occupied. So they write an offer, they don't include the TOPA, but the listing agent and the seller are going to know if the offer is, if the property is tenant occupied. And if it is, they need to counter back that TOPA because the TOPA, the tenant occupied property addendum, has all the information regarding what's going to happen with that tenant. So it's very important that that form be used uh, whenever there's a tenant in the property, and if the buyer doesn't use it in the offer, the tenant, the seller needs to use it in a counter offer. So I'm going to keep going along here. Um, there's a, a little change on the home warranty, but nothing uh, all that exciting. It just says that the buyer can choose whatever they want to choose. Uh, under four, there's been added in a checkbox for mis mixed use purchase addendum, which is a new form that came out if you're writing an offer on a property that's part residential and part commercial. Uh, there's a little thing in paragraph five about what happens if there's no deposit uh, put into escrow and there's a default by the buyer. Um, and as we go down under paragraph seven, uh, there's a paragraph seven, eight occupancy, which again talks about the TOPA. And if the buyer is buying units, let's say, and the buyer wants to occupy one of the units, then the buyer needs to notify the seller which unit they want to occupy so that the seller could try to get that particular tenant out of that particular unit. And going down further, um, nothing too exciting with the red stuff here. Um, nothing too exciting here. Just all kind of minor changes, minor changes, minor changes. Hope I'm not getting you dizzy. And then as we get further down, there is something else down here that I wanted to cover. Under M, under 11M, solar systems, uh, there's a new form that I'm going to cover in a little bit called a, uh, it's a solar form. It's it's a questionnaire uh, and a disclosure about solar panels if the property has solar panels. So paragraph M says for properties with any solar panels or solar systems, the seller shall within the time specified paragraph three and one, deliver to the buyer all known information about the solar panel, and then there's this form, the new solar form that I'll cover a little bit later. Uh, so that's important. Um, one of the things that would change now is it used to be in paragraph 12 that in addition to what's there, they had the approval of the seller documents, so the document seller delivers to the buyer. And that was problematical because when you remove contingencies, there was a contingency removal box where you would check removing all the contingencies in paragraph 12 which is basically the investigation of the property, but that also included the seller documentation. And it really shouldn't. The seller documentation is a, a separate contingency and it's found in pair, I'm gonna go back, it's found in paragraph eight. And in paragraph eight, you have um, somewhere in here, 8D is the review of seller documents. So now when you're reviewing the seller documents, that contingency is removed in a separate uh, checkbox in the contingency removal form, and it's separated out from paragraph 12. So if you remove paragraph 12, which is the in investigation of the property, you're not automatically reviewing the review of the seller documents because they're really two separate things. You could be removing the investigation of the property and not even got the seller documents yet. So that's been separated out so that when you remove paragraph 12, you're not automatically removing the seller documents. That's a separate removal. And then going back down, and try not to get dizzy again. Um, Nothing too exciting here, nothing too exciting there. And there's a statement, this, this has to do with paragraph 3G3 again, which we'll talk about later. And then at the very end, uh, under paragraph 23, 
there was some question about the difference between an assignment and a nomination or an assignee and a nominee. And the committee felt that people might have been trying to circumvent the assignment clause by calling somebody a nominee rather than an assignee. And so the committee changed this now to say that an assignee and a nominee are basically the same thing for purpose of this contract. So if you're trying to do an assignment or a nomination, it's the same thing and the same provisions apply. So you can't try to say it's a nominee and that the assignment paragraph doesn't apply. So that's the perfect purpose of putting assignee and nominee and bunching it together. And then uh, under counting days, under paragraph I here, it has a reference to the code section as to what counts as a legal holiday when you're talking about like, you know, notice to perform and demand to close and things like that. And then at the very end, Jeff, uh, hold on. Uh, let me just let me, let, let me just finish this and I'll, I'll, I'll get your question. And then at the very end, there's a place for additional information for the buyer, the listing agent and the buyer's agents um, contact information. OK, go ahead, Rich. So going back to assignment nom nomination, so yeah. the AOAA changing to reflect to also say nomination? Um, I believe that it is. I, I, I don't know for a certain, but I believe it is. Um, and I'm seeing it as a review. So. Yeah, I can't recall if it is, but but because it's in here in the purchase agreement, it would cover any anything that has to do with nomination. So it's been covered in the first document, which is the purchase agreement. Um, so anytime you're dealing with an assignment or nomination, you would use the AOAA form. I can't remember what what if anything was mentioned in the AOA form about the nomination, but it's covered here. So this would, you know, this would apply to use of the AOA. Thanks. Okay. Any questions now that I finished the purchase agreement? Any questions on the changes to the purchase agreement? If not, I'm gonna go to the next one question. If if the audience agree or your commission is three percent and the the MLS commission is two and a half, you can argue that the seller pay that extra half percent. Yeah, it's, you're not arguing it. It's, it would be the, it would not be you. It would be, it would be the buyer requesting it. In other words, the buyer has a buyer broker agreement with you to pay two and a half. Uh, you become familiar with the fact that the listing agent is only paying two to the buyer's agent. And therefore you as the buyer are required to pay that other half percent because the, the representation agreement says the buyer will pay two and a half unless somebody else pays it, and then there's a, an offset. Well, if you're paying two and a half and the listing agent's only paying two, then there's a half percent that the buyer's still required to pay. And the buyer can ask the seller to pay that by using that paragraph 3G in a form that I'm gonna cover a little later. What if we normally ask for three, three and a half and we settle for two and a half? And in this case, we can get the seller to pay the buyer an additional half percent to their agent, which is us. I, I didn't understand the question, say it again. Someone can help me translate that. So I, I have a buyer who's willing to pay 3%. MLS okay. payment is 2.5%. So I can get this, we can get the seller to pay the extra half percent to fulfill a yeah. condition. Yeah. Awesome. That's the purpose of 3G. Yeah. And I'll cover that a little bit later when I get to that form because that's that's one of the new forms. <clears throat> so now I'm going to cover. You can ask the seller to pay, you're asking the seller to pay more than what they're offering in the MLS. Yes. Yes, you're, because you're not you're not um, having them. Uh, you're, you're, it's it's not part of the MLS. You're asking the buyer. You're asking the seller <clears throat> to pay part of the buyer's obligation to the buyer's agent. It's different than the MLS offer of compensation. It's 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 hard to follow and it's confusing, but it's different than a buyer's agent going in and saying, "You offered me two and a half percent. I want three. This is the buyer saying, "I'm obligated to pay two and a half percent." You're offering two. I want you, seller, to pay the other half a percent. And it's not the agent asking it. It's the buyer and the seller involved in negotiations. But the seller can say no, right? Absolutely. The seller can say no. It's part. It's just part of the offer. The seller says, no, I'm not doing it. This is all a move. And you just have, you have to have the buyer broker agreement. That's the only way you can. The only way this works is with a buyer broker agreement. If there's no buyer broker agreement, there's no agreement for the buyer to pay. And therefore, this, this paragraph wouldn't apply. Awesome. So it's not going to it's not going to kick in very often. It's only going to kick in when you're using a buyer broker and when the the buyer broker has the buyer is obligated themselves to pay more than what the listing broker is paying and the buyer says okay, I want the list, the seller to pay it and then the seller can say no or yes. It's 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 no different than countering price. It's just, you know, it all works into the into the to price and and the net that the buyer and the seller are getting and paying. Okay, we're going to move along now to the buyer counteroffer form. So the buyer counteroffer form um, there's really the item one B didn't really change. It's it's in red, but 
a little bit of a language change, but basically what 1B said, the major change is 1C. What 1B says is that if there's a change in the counter offer, let's say you're offering a million dollars, and then I, I don't know if there's anything available for a million dollars. Let's say you're offering $2 million. So now you can get a nice two bedroom, one bathroom house, right? Um, so you're, you're offering on the property a million, you get countered at a million one. What paragraph B says is that the down payment and the loan amount adjust in the same proportion. So if you're doing an 80-20 deal, an 80% loan and 20% down, and you counter $100,000 higher, then it's still 80-20. But it also says that the dollar amount for the deposit does not change. Now, this is one of those categories where I kind of lost the argument. I kind of thought that the deposit should, because usually the deposit is 3%, not always, but usually. But I got outvoted at the committee level. And so they're saying the deposit does not automatically change. That's really important for the listing agent and the seller. So if you have an offer that's a million and you counted a million one, the down payment and the loan stay 80-20, but the deposit doesn't stay 3% because it says right here, the deposit stays the same. So you need to counter that counter if you want to and say the deposit will not be 30,000, but it'll be 33,000. If you don't do that, the deposit stays the same as the original deposit. So it's really important as the listing agent and the seller to keep that in mind. Uh, I would have preferred that it, it, just, it just be in the same proportion as the down payment and the loan, but I, I lost that argument. So item C, deals with something else. Item C says, unless otherwise agreed or altered in the counteroffer, if in the original offer, the appraisal contingency is lower than the original offered price, then the dollar amount of any difference, the appraisal gap, shall be deducted from the final contract price to create the new appraisal contingency amount. Personally, I think this language is, is very confusing. I think the language is super confusing, but let me explain what it means. And I tried to get this language changed, but they didn't change it. So uh, what this what this means, I'm going to explain what it means. What it means is, let's say you have an offer for a million dollars. And remember in that appraisal contingency, you now have the ability to say, the buyer can say, well, if it appraises at least at 950, I'll still buy the property. So it's a million dollar purchase price. But if it appraises at 950, I'll still buy the property and I'll just pay the 50,000 in cash. So what this is saying is that if that's filled in, where the, where the buyer agrees to pay a dollar differential, like from a million to 950, that if there's a counter offer at a million one, that the, the buyer is not saying, okay, now I'll pay 150,000, whatever that dollar gap was stays the same. So if you countered a million one, the buyer is only willing to still make up that 50,000 difference at a million 50,000. So, because it wouldn't make sense to say, if the original offer said the, the buyer is willing to come up 50,000 in cash, and then you counter 200,000 higher, then now all of a sudden the buyer's paying 250,000 in cash. So that's what this language C says. And I'm going to read it again, because maybe now that I've explained it, it, it makes a little bit more sense. It says, unless otherwise agreed or altered in the counter offer, if the original offer, in the original offer, the appraisal contingency amount is lower than the original offered price. So again, if, if you, you offered a million, but you put in 950, the buyer would still buy it. Then the dollar amount of any difference, the appraisal gap, shall be deducted from the final contract price. So now you're doing a million one and the appraisal gap was 50,000 and then you get the new final appraisal contingency amount. So hopefully that explains what that means. Again, I don't like the language, but does everybody understand now what we're talking about? We're talking about that appraisal amount, whatever the buyer agreed to pay dollar wise stays the same if the offer gets upped. Okay. Any questions on that? That's only if you put an appraisal cap on the counter, right? On the offer. Yeah, if the if the offer if the offer doesn't have if the offer just says it's contingent upon the appraisal coming in at value, then this paragraph doesn't apply. Okay. It only applies if and, and it doesn't happen very often, and probably not as often now in the market that's changing. But if you had a buyer who said, okay, you know, it's it's a it's it's selling for a million and I'll pay fifty thousand difference if appraisal comes in low, that's when it would apply. And again. That was more, I think that was more relevant probably three, four months ago than it is now. You probably don't have nearly as many buyers saying that now. And and Jeff, if if the buyer doesn't have, if they're raising the price and now they don't have that gap, then that, that clause needs to be countered out. Correct? Yeah, correct, correct. If, 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 if they're raising the price 
and now the buyer doesn't have that fifty thousand dollars anymore because the price is being raised. You'd have to counter that out, and you put it you you'd put into a counter offer that the, the property has to praise at value or whatever. You know, the, the property has to praise at the purchase price. Does that answer your question, Rich? Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the change on the counter offer. Any more questions on that? You guys have any more questions? Yeah. What, what is <laughs> I, I can't. I can't hear any. Of that. Any, any serious questions for Jeff? Okay, now go ahead. Okay. Um, the next form is the cancellation of contract disposition and deposit. Uh, there was a change made in this form under the proposed mutual cancellation. You know, normally when you use this form, one party or the other is canceling. But sometimes you have a proposed mutual cancellation where the buyer and seller say, "Okay, we've agreed to cancel." But only one party is signing this originally, and so the committee put a time frame in here. If the part, if one of the parties is asking for mutual cancellation, then the other party would have like three days until 5 p.m. to say yes or no. And then once that time frame runs out, there's no mutual cancellation anymore. So it's just a matter of putting a time frame in, so it's not just not just out there forever. So that's the only change to the cancellation of contract form. Um, moving down to the exempt seller disclosure form. This is the form that you would use if you're a probate or an REO or, or some exempt from the TDS. But one of the things that the committee became aware of is that there are times that a seller may not be exempt from the TDS. They have to fill out a TDS, but they may counter out giving an SPQ because the SPQ is not a statutory requirement. The TDS is statutorily required of all sellers unless you're exempt. The SPQ is just a contractual requirement in the RPA. And a seller might say, well, I have to give the SP, I have to give the TDS because I'm required to, I'm not exempt, but I don't know that much about the property. I'm not giving an SPQ. And they can do that. They can counter that out in a counter offer. But if you counter out the SPQ, the problem with that is that under paragraph four, these questions four A through K, every seller, even an exempt seller from a TDS, has to answer questions four A through K. So for those that are exempt, the, like REOs and probates, that's why this question is here is because exempt sellers have to answer that. And sellers who aren't filling out an SPQ, because these questions are in an SPQ, they would still have to fill this form out because they have to answer question four. So that's the only change here is a change to the top saying this form is not only for people who aren't filling a TDS, but for those who aren't exempt, but aren't filling an SPQ. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving along unless I hear otherwise. Extension of time amendment. It used to be an extension of time addendum, and now they've made it an extension of time amendment. The difference is there is now a time frame to respond. So on the addendum, there was no time frame. It was just, you know, somebody would say, okay, I want to extend the escrow period for, you know, until such and such a date or the contingencies. And it was just out there in the open with no time frame. Now we've made it an amendment. So that if one party wants to get an extension of the escrow or contingencies or whatever, there's a time frame, and again, it defaults to three days at 5 p.m. for the other party to agree. And if they don't agree, then this extension doesn't uh, take effect. So it's just a matter of, of putting a time frame in there so it doesn't, it's not open forever. Um, the next thing is a lease listing agreement. There was a separate committee, a separate subcommittee or task force uh of property managers and and people who do leases which i was not on that did some changes to the lease listing agreement i'm not going to go over all the changes in there but the one thing i wanted to mention is that you'll notice there's no reference to landlord anymore at the top it says rental property owner or rpo so why did the committee change that i mean i had asked the same question because i didn't know why that was changed and the reason they changed it is that there are property managers out there, and I'm not suggesting that you should do this, and you shouldn't even be doing property management anyway, unless you have special permission from the brokerage to do it. But property managers sometimes have a contract with the landlord where they will actually sign and have authority to sign on behalf of the landlord. So the, the task force, the property management task force decided that instead of saying landlord, it should say rental property owner, and define that as, as either the landlord or it could be the property manager if they have authority to sign on behalf of the landlord. I'm not telling you you, you should ever do that. I don't think you should uh, take on the responsibility of signing on behalf of the landlord if you're a property manager. Certainly, if you're not a property manager, there's no way you would do that. Uh, and again, you shouldn't be doing property management anyway. 
unless you have some special arrangement with your brokerage that you can do it under a separate brokerage license or whatever. Uh, so there are other changes in this form. But again, you can see them if you go to uh, car.org and the standard forms. They've separated out the move-in and move-out form. It used to be a move-in, move-out form. Now there's a separate move-in form and a separate move-out form, so it's not so confusing. Obviously, the move-in form is used at the time the tenant moves in, and the move-out form is used when the tenant moves out. Um, and there's some other changes in here that you can check out when you, uh, when you go to um, the car.org. And one of the changes is under paragraph 12B. There's a new form, which I'm going to cover in a little bit, called a rental property owner disclosure. It kind of mirrors the, the um, in, in a way, it mirrors the um, SPQ form, the seller property questionnaire, but it's for rental properties. But I'm going to cover that in a little bit. It's the new RPOD form. Um, and um, so that's that form. And any questions on the revision? To, now, there's other reforms that are being revised. And if you go to CIR.org and look at standard forms, you'll see that revisions. But these are the major, in my opinion, the major revisions that would impact you and your clients. Um, and with that, I'm going to flip over now to the new forms that have come out. Were there any questions on the revised forms I covered? Yes. Yeah, so now that we have a separate move in move out form, so do we give the move out forms to our clients? You, 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 yeah, you can, give, you can give them the, it's not your responsibility to fill out the form, but you certainly can provide the form. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the new forms that are coming out. So well, the first one I want to cover is the non-contingent offer advisory. This might be a little bit late in the process. It probably would have been better four months ago, uh, but the committee felt that uh, because there were so many offers being written without investigation contingencies, without inspection contingencies, without loan and, and uh, appraisal contingencies, that there should be a standalone form that, that uh, attaches to the RPA, which basically says that if you're making a non-contingent offer, especially if it's non-contingent on the loan, I mean, on the uh, investigation, that you're, what the risks are, and that you're doing so against the broker's advice. So this form can be, you don't need this form. This is not a mandatory form to use all the time, but anytime you have a buyer who is going to waive or, or get rid of upfront, especially their investigation contingency, but also their loan or the appraisal, I would suggest using this form because this form states pretty clearly the risk associated with removing those uh, contingencies up front and the broker saying that um, you know th th they're not responsible if, if you do that and then there's a problem later on. So again, not a mandatory form, but I would use it anytime the buyer tells you they're going to be removing any one of those major contingencies. I have a question. Form. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, is this in addition to the um, inspection waiver? Yeah, this is a separate form from the inspection waiver. Um, the you can use the inspection waiver, but this is a form that advises the buyer uh, what the risks are of making offers that are not contingent on either a loan, an appraisal, or especially the investigation contingency and the inspections. And we had our own version yeah. of this in this office. Yeah, you may have your own version that you've already been using, but CIR come out with a standard form. So if you have your own version, that's fine. You don't need to use the CIR, the CIR form if your version covers basically the same stuff. Um, and I think that's a form that I drafted a while back, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah it comes from Kathy Maringer's. Yeah, exactly. It came from Kathy, then I changed it a little bit, and then I gave it to you. So you kind of already had that form. But this is just the CAR standard form version, so you could use either one. Now, the solar advising, because we have so many issues with solar now, the committee decided they come up with uh, an advisory and a questionnaire. So the advisory is advising the buyer and seller about all the... Uh, situation relative to the solar panels and solar systems and all the risks, et cetera, et cetera. But then after the advisory portion, there's actually a questionnaire which the seller should fill out at the time of the listing agreement so that you know what you've got with the solar system so that it can be provided to the buyer and the buyer knows what they need to know about the solar system, whether it's leased, whether it's whether it's owned but leaned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of stuff with the solar systems that the buyer needs to be concerned about. Um, so this is a uh, questionnaire that should be filled out at the time of the listing agreement and given to the buyer uh, upon acceptance of the offer so they can investigate the solar and figure out what they, you know, what they need to do with that. So this is a brand new form uh, that'll be out next week. Um, with that, I'm going to get to the uh, buyer representation and broker compensation agreement. This is the uh, new form that's coming out uh, to replace right now. 
in the CAR zip form library, you have three buyer representation agreements. You have one for no compensation at all. It's just a disclosure about buyer representation. Uh, very rarely gets used. You've got a non-exclusive uh, form, which says that if you are involved in a property and the buyer buys it, that you should get paid. And then you have an exclusive, which says that no matter what happens, if they buy a property during the term of the exclusive, you get paid. So those three forms are all going away and they're being replaced by this one form, which is the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement. This form um, will, uh, you'll see at the top that it has a number of days instead of a date. It says beginning on such dates and ending blank days uh, after later. And the reason they did days instead of a date is they wanted the buyer to be aware, especially if it's an exclusive agreement about how long this agreement is because some of the agents were doing these agreements for way too long and trying to lock buyers in for like a year or two to a buyer exclusive agreement. Um, the form number two says there's no pre-existing buyer representation agreement that they've signed. <clears throat> Paragraph three is the same as it was before. It, it, it describes what the buyer's looking for as far as location and price range, et cetera. And then when you get to paragraph five, you'll notice that the, um, the form uh, defaults to a non-exclusive representation under 5B1. <clears throat> under paragraph, I'm sorry, 4B1. Under paragraph four, you need to fill in a commission amount. If you don't fill in a commission amount, then this form it kind of defaults to what you had before in a non-compensation by a representation agreement. You're, you're letting them know that you represent them, but you don't have any commission that they're paying. So you have to fill this in if you expect, expect expect to get paid on a buyer broker agreement. So this has to be filled in. You can't leave it blank and just say, you know, I'll get paid by the listing agent because if you don't get paid by the listing agent, the buyer hasn't agreed to anything. So it needs to be filled out. But then under item 4B1, it, it defaults to a non-exclusive representation. And then it defines better than it did in the past when you as a broker would be entitled to come to collect on a non-exclusive it says on a non-exclusive compensation is payable only when there is broker involvement with the property and then it defines broker involvement as any of the following buyer physically entered and was shown the property by the broker the broker showed the property to the buyer virtually the broker submitted to seller a signed written offer from the buyer to acquire lease or exchange the property or the property was introduced to the buyer by the broker or one for which the broker acted on buyer's behalf. And then it says, however, merely sending buyer a list of properties shall not be deemed buyer involvement without documented action on the part of the broker analyzing the property for the buyer specifically or assisting the buyer in potentially acquisi potential acquisition of the property or communicating with the seller or the seller's agent, blah, blah, blah. So what it's saying here is that in order to be entitled to a commission on a non-exclusive, Either you have to have shown the property, either physically or virtually, you have to have written an offer, or you have to have involvement in the property beyond just a drip system where you send the buyer 100 properties and then try to claim that, well, I told the buyer about this property. It's one of the 100 I sent to him. You actually have to do stuff on it. You have to actually talk to the buyer about it and follow up on it, follow up with the seller or listing agent. Oh, my God. What a concept. We actually have to work, guys. Oh, my yeah, word. imagine that. You have, to, you have to actually do some work on it. Um, which is different than the exclusive, because now we're going to get to the exclusive. And so the default is the non-exclusive. On the ex You could check the box for the exclusive, and now you've turned it into exclusive representation. But you'll notice on the exclusive that we have some bold print language in there. It says, this agreement shall be exclusive and irrevocable. And it says, um, the broker is entitled to compensation if the buyer acquires the property during the representation period with or without broker involvement, even if another broker is entitled to be paid for representing the buyer. So that bold print is there to basically knock the buyer over the head and say, you understand if you sign this as an exclusive agreement that you're obligated to pay the broker you sign this with, even if you wind up going with another broker and they have to be paid too. So that's why that bold print is there. Um, and then under paragraph C, there are different cancellation rights depending on whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive. And I'll explain that. If it's non-exclusive, then the buyer can simply cancel anytime they want to by just giving a notice to the to the listing agent. I mean, to you as the buyer's agent, and by giving you that notice, they've canceled going forward. But if you've already been involved with the property, if you already if you already showed the property, if you already were involved with it, you would still be entitled to get paid, even though the buyer is now canceling the non-exclusive agreement. So once they cancel, you're done going forward with them. But anything you've already shown them, you would still be entitled to get paid. But on the exclusive agreement, um, that's a different time frame because on an exclusive agreement, 
we wanted to make sure that a buyer who signs an exclusive agreement doesn't sign it, then walks into an open house and decides to buy the property through the listing agent and then sends you a cancellation saying, see you later, I'm canceling and I'm buying it through the listing agent. Mm -hmm. So in order to avoid that problem, we put in a 30 day time frame, and you'll see it under paragraph. It says, uh, if paragraph 4B1 applies, then you can give any notice. But if 4B2 applies, which makes it exclusive, then you have to give at least a 30 day notice. And by the way, either the buyer or the broker can give that notice to cancel. So that would hopefully would avoid the problem of a buyer walking into an open house and deciding to write an offer with a listing agent and then sending you a cancellation because they'd have to wait 30 days in order for, for not to owe you a commission. So that's your safety valve on an exclusive. Um, and then under paragraph C2, there's a checkbox, which I, I, I wasn't a big fan of this, but there's a checkbox saying that the neither party shall have the right to cancel this agreement prior to expiration except by mutual agreement. So if you have an exclusive agreement, you could actually check box two, which would then get rid of the cancellation and say, no, you have an exclusive agreement with me for this amount of time, you can't cancel it. Um, so that that checkbox, personally, I would prefer that not be there because it <laughs> takes away the whole point of the buyer being able to cancel if they're in a, a long-term exclusive agreement and they're not comfortable working with this broker anymore or vice versa. Um, and then the rest of the form is kind of similar to what it was before. It talks about um, you know, compensation and timing of the compensation and how it gets paid and agency, et cetera, et cetera. So the main changes are all in paragraph, the paragraph on the first page, paragraph, uh, basically paragraph four has all the main changes in this form. Uh, now, CAR uh, is, is there's, there's all kinds of lawsuits going on now uh, uh, that involve MLS offer of compensation, uh, notifying the buyer of what the buyer's agent is going to be getting paid. So the thinking is that the buyer broker agreements are going to get more used in California. In some states, they're required. Uh, CAR didn't feel that they wanted the legislature to require this form because it would create all kinds of problems in their opinion. So it's not mandatory at all, but it's a form that you can use. And again, that you have the various options of exclusive, non-exclusive, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, the reason that the uh, 30-day cancellation, once again, was put in there is the, the committee felt that there were too many brokers out there, too many agents out there that were misusing the exclusive form. And what they were doing is they would write an offer. Um, and when they wrote the offer, they would slip in the, uh, the exclusive representation agreement and have the buyer sign it. And the buyer didn't realize they were signing some document that said that for a year, they were going to have to pay the broker or the agent, even if the agent wasn't working with them on the property. And to avoid that problem, uh, the committee felt that there should be a cancellation right to get the, the buyer out of it if they want out and they're not comfortable working with the broker anymore, uh, but still protecting the broker because they, they have to give a 30-day cancellation notice. So are there any, and, and there's four more forms that I'm going to cover here that go along with this buyer representation agreement, but I'll just pause here for any questions. I, I have a question, Jeff. <clears throat> um, the, the uh, buyer agreements that we have currently that are still, you know, not um, expired yet, will they, is that okay to go forward into 2023 with them? Well, they're going to disappear from the library next week. Um, so if you already have them, sure. If, if you've already had them signed, then they still, they, they still apply. Anything that's already been signed is still, is still valid. Um, but as of December 22nd or whatever the date is, 20th, those won't be in the library anymore and you'll be using the new form. So yeah, anything you had before still is, is, is valid. Um, Jeff, if you put in the percentage, it becomes exclusive, correct? I, I, I couldn't hear you. Can you put, yeah. If you put in the percentage, it becomes exclusive? No. No. No, no the, percent, the percentage, no. If you put in the percentage, that's what you get paid, whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive. The percentage should be put in no matter what. It applies to exclusive or non-exclusive. Okay. And so, um, and the other thing, the 30 days, if they don't actually cancel those, then it lasts longer than 30 days. Yeah, if they don't cancel, it keeps going on, and, and it was for whatever, whatever the length of the uh, whatever the length you put in there on paragraph one. They have the right to cancel, and you have the right to cancel too. You may have a buyer you just don't want to work with anymore, and you might want to cancel. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, okay. Moving along, I don't hear any other questions, so I'm going to move along to the next form, which is called the cancellation of buyer representation. So, because there's a an ability to cancel. Then there's a form that was created that would allow the buyer or the broker to cancel. And again, no notice needs to be given for canceling a non-exclusive, 
but a 30 day notice needs to be given for canceling exclusive. And that's all covered in paragraph B1 and B2. And in paragraph E, it basically says that, hey, you know, you can cancel uh, on a non-exclusive, but if I've already introduced you to a property, you're still going to have to pay me. Um, so that's the form that can be used by a broker or a buyer to cancel the buyer representation agreement, whether it be exclusive or non-exclusive. Um, and then the next form is the notice of broker involved property. So um, in the uh, representation agreement, if you're doing a non-exclusive, if it's non-exclusive, then it says in there that if the buyer decides to cancel that, or if it's terminating, you know, if it's running out, you just like on the listing agreement where you have a right to camp, to uh, register buyers that saw the property during your listing, you have the right to register broker-involved properties um, that the buyer would be obligated to pay you. So let's say either the time frame has run out for the listing or, or for this buyer broker agreement, or they cancel on you, you still have the ability to go to the buyer and say, okay, you're canceling this, you're terminating this agreement, but here's the properties that I've been involved with that you still owe me a commission on. And then in paragraph four, you'd have a place to fill in those properties. Now you can actually fill those in on the cancellation form itself. On the cancellation of buyer representation, there is a place to fill in um, right here, uh, somewhere in there it was, I believe, let's see. Um, I seem to remember a place where you could fill in. Oh, here it is. Under a 3B2 or 3A2, there's a place where you could fill in the properties that you've been involved with. So you wouldn't need that separate form, but there's only two lines here. So let's say you introduced them to eight properties, then there's not enough room here. And then you would use the notice of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to make you dizzy here. You would use the notice of broker involved properties. So if it's more than a couple of properties, you need more space and you have more space under paragraph four. And then a new form that's been developed is oh, the, the buyer transactional advisory is going to be, um, it's going to be lumped in with the buyer representation agreement. If you use a buyer representation agreement, this form will auto populate with the buyer representation agreement. And it's basically a representation or a disclosure to the buyer as to agency and, and what the buyer's obligations are and the broker's obligations, et cetera, et cetera. So this will auto, auto populate every time you use the buyer representation agreement. The next form, which is the anticipated broker compensation disclosure, this is something different than the buyer representation agreement. This, this came from, there, there was, some of you may be aware that there was almost a settlement between the Department of Justice and the National Association of Realtors about the buyer's agent disclosing to the buyer what commission they're getting paid. The listing agent and the seller have an agreement, the listing agreement, where the seller knows what they're paying and who they're paying it to. But the buyers in the past really don't know what the buyer's agent's getting paid. And apparently there's quite a move to uh, get to the point where the buyer is required to know by the buyer's agent what the buyer's agent's getting paid. And it isn't the law yet because that settlement fell apart, but it's coming. So the committee developed a form that you can use, it's called the ABCD form, Anticipated Broker Compensation Disclosure, where you have a, play, let's say you're showing the buyer, I have to say this is a pain in the neck, but let's say you're showing the buyer five properties today. And you, you know, obviously, you know, the commission from the MLS, you could fill in the five properties here and say, for these properties, I'm getting X for this property, X for this property, X for this, blah, 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 blah. The other thing you can do is I believe the MLSs now are going to be providing the, uh, the, the public form will have the commission in there. So you could actually provide your buyer with a copy of the public information from the MLS and it will show the commission payable to the buyer's agent, which will accomplish the same thing as this form would accomplish. So this is a form you can use. Again, it's not the law yet, but it's coming. So you might as well start getting used to it. There's no question that the, the at the end of the day, uh, the buyer is going to be uh, allowed to, or and it's going to be required that the buyer's agent disclose to the buyer what they're getting paid on any particular transaction. Um, now, the next form, the next form is a seller payment to the buyer's broker. This is the form in that 3G we talked about. Remember, we talked about what if the um, buyer has signed a buyer representation agreement, they're, they're paying uh, 3%, they've agreed to pay 3%. The listing agent is only authorized to pay two and a half percent, and the buyer wants to get the seller to pay that additional half percent. This is the form that you would use 
to accomplish that. And if you um, if you uh, have a buyer representation agreement, and if you check that box, that 3G box, this will auto populate with it, and you'll fill this out. And you'll see under paragraph one, it says buyers entered into a written agreement to compensate buyers broker X. As of this date, the seller payment is X, and we want you to pay the difference, basically, the seller. And again, it's not the agent asking the listing agent to pay anything. It's the buyer asking the seller. It's totally negotiable, and the seller can simply say no if they want to. It does not violate MLS rules to do it this way, but it's very confusing because it seems like all of a sudden you're making commission a part of the offer, which you've been told for years and years and years and years you cannot do. So it's confusing. And personally, uh, I think this is being done. My personal opinion is that they're kind of they're they're trying to be proactive on this and do it before it's it's really required by law or whatever. But I kind of think that being proactive here may be creating more confusion than it's solving. But there you have it. You you do have the ability without violating MS rules for the buyer who has signed a buyer broker agreement to ask the seller to pay the difference. It's not the agents, it's the buyer. So it's part of the offer and it's part of the buyer asking the seller to pay. So this is the form you would use for that. And again, it would auto populate if you check that box um, mm -hmm. in the contract. So, um, yeah, go ahead. So this is only used if there is a difference between the compensation between the buyer broker. Agreement. It's, it, yeah. it would only be used. Yeah. Be, well, because the, the, because the buyer broker agreement already says that let's, let's say that the buyer agrees to pay 3%. It already says in there, if somebody else pays that, if the seller pays it, you don't know it. So if, if the buyer has agreed to pay 3% and the listing's paying 3%, it's already taken care of. The only time it, it comes into play is when there's a, there's a, a gap between what the buyer agreed to pay and what the listing agent's paying the buyer's agent. Okay. So your answer, you are correct. All right. So you're saying that like if we get our buyers to sign the BRE, all these forms need to be filled out as well? No. If, if you're getting a, a buyer representation agreement, you don't need the other forms until the time you would need, need them. So you don't need a cancellation of the buyer representation agreement unless somebody's canceling. You don't need a um, you don't need the registration unless you're registering properties involved. Uh, you don't need the the buyer transactional advisory would be uh, auto populated, so that would be included. Um, the anticipated broker compensation disclosure is a completely separate thing. It's it's something you would use just to disclose your whether you, whether you have a buyer representation agreement or not. You have to disclose to the buyer what you're getting paid. And the buyer payment to the broker would only be uh, used if you're if you're checking that box and asking the seller to pay part of that money. Um, and then the next form is the rental property owner disclosure. This is the form I mentioned earlier that the property management group came up with. It's kind of like the SPQ, but for rentals. And again, I'm only going to tell you what the rash, rationale of the property management committee was because I'm not on that committee. But they, they felt that this form should be filled out by the listing agent and the landlord at the time the uh, listing is taken so that everybody knows what needs to be disclosed. But they're also saying that this is not a form that necessarily gets passed along to the tenant. Um, I don't really understand why it wouldn't get passed along to the tenant since it has all this information in it. Uh, but the committee said it's a form, it's like a worksheet for the listing agent and the and the landlord to fill out so everybody knows what needs to be disclosed, but not necessarily a form that needs to be given to the tenant, although it seems to me that probably it is something that should be given to the tenant because it has all this information in it. Um, so again, it kind of sets up kind of like the SPQ, but for but for rentals. Um, that takes care of what I wanted to cover, and I'm going to... Um, stop sharing now. Okay. That takes care of what I wanted to cover on the new and revised forms. Um, but um, again, if you want to see them, or if you want to see the uh, up the, the form that explains all the different uh, updates and all the different revisions and new forms, just go to car.org, click on the standard forms tab. You'll see like a five or so page um, review of what the changes are. It'll tell you this form's been revised and here's what the change is. This form is new and here's what we, we put it in there for. So you can look through that and it gives you a pretty good uh, reference to what's going on for new and revised forms. And again, you can actually see the newer revised forms at car.org now or the standard forms tab. Um, with that, um, Rich and Stephanie, tell me 
um, I was going to cover a few prop, uh, a few just risk management things. But tell me what what time. If I'm out of time, then I'm out of time. If I have ten more minutes, I got ten more minutes. What what what's your pleasure? Well, <laughs> and you could tell by how many people have fallen asleep in the room. If more than half of the, if more than half of the people are asleep, we should probably end it now. But if you only have two or three asleep, then if you want me to go a few more minutes, I will. Yeah. Well, hold on, everybody. Let's go with risk management. I mean, Jeff, you know, we've been going through all the EO policy, all that kind of stuff. And risk management is such, I mean, I want you all to get how one important your job is to the highest level. Do you understand? You guys are representing clients to, you know, multi millions, five, it doesn't even matter what dollar amount. But this is all contracts. This is all stuff. It, you guys have to take it seriously. So, Go Jeff, go ahead with your risk management stuff. Okay, I'll cover. I'll cover a few things on on risk management. First thing I wanted to cover is to try to keep you out of trouble is ADA <laughs> compliance on your websites, the American Disabilities Act compliance on your website. So I'm sure all of you have websites. Some of your websites may be provided to you by the brokerage. But some of you undoubtedly have your own websites that are not connected in any way to the brokerage. All those websites need to be ADA compliant. So what does that mean? Well, basically, it means that a disabled person, whether they're disabled by virtue of, of being blind or deaf or whatever, they need to be able to access the material on your website just like anybody else can. And if they can't, they have the right to file a federal lawsuit against you, which is not what you want. Now, there are a couple of people out there that are professional trollers, and they have several of them have already been caught and sanctioned by the court. We have we had one that sent out almost 200 letters to different brokerages claiming that they were disabled and they couldn't access the website. And the court threw one of them out because they asked this guy, one of the one of the standards for being able to file a lawsuit is you have to be a potential customer, not a troller, but actually a potential customer. And the court says, well, how are you a potential customer of these 150 brokerages? And the guy actually said, well, I don't have the money right now, but if I win the lottery, then I would definitely be interested in buying a property. <laughs> it's like the judge just sanctioned him and threw him out of court. And we have another one, that a separate guy who sent out several hundred letters and a couple of our brokerages have gotten them. And CAR already sent a letter to this guy saying, we know what you're doing. And you're just trolling to try to get settlements and get a few thousand dollars here and a few thousand dollars there. But putting that aside, there are legitimate people out there who are disabled who may not be able to use your website and you've got to avoid that lawsuit. So uh, when we're done here, if you haven't already done this, you need to check with your web designer and determine whether your website is compliant. Now, I'm not the one that can tell you whether it's compliant or not because I don't know all the rules. But if you go on the internet, if you go to Google, you will find a number of different companies who specialize in making your websites ADA compliant. One of them is called Accessibility. It's like Ace, I don't know how it's Accessibility, e -S -E -C -C -E -S -S -I capital B E E or something like that. And they're one of the companies that does that, but there are several companies that do that. And uh, you want to, if you're not sure if your website is ADA compliant, first check with your web designer. And if they don't know or if it isn't, then you need to contact one of these companies. Some of them charge like a monthly fee, which isn't that much, to add the tools that you need to make your site ABA compliant. Really important because once you get in a lawsuit, and if you get in a legitimate lawsuit with somebody who really is disabled, you're going to lose because it's a it's it's statutory and there's no defense to it. Basically, um, the the next thing I wanted to cover was, and we've covered this many times before, is the do not call list. Same kind of thing. If you if you violate the do not call list and you call somebody whose cell phone is on the do not call list, you are subject to a lawsuit and it could be in federal court as well as state court or small claims court where you're probably going to lose uh, unless you can show somehow that uh, you didn't violate that by calling somebody on the do not call list. Um, and the most of you may be using companies who provide you lists. And we had a meeting about uh, three weeks ago with a bunch of uh litigators, CAR litigators, not 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 working for CAR, but people, attorneys who, you know, deal with CAR a lot and, and CAR recommends to their clients. And one of the discussions that came up regarding the do not call list was if you're, a lot of companies will give you a list that supposedly has scrubbed the list for do not call. So you get a list and they said, we have taken out the do not calls. Now, 
some of the lists don't do that. You know, the cheaper ones may just give you a list and it has all the do not call people in there. There is a defense that some of the litigators have said, if you can show that you used a company that told you that they had scrubbed all of the do not call telephone numbers off of that list, that may be a potential defense to show that you made a good faith effort to scrub those and not call them, but the web designer, or I'm not sorry, the web, web designer, the, the company that gave you the list messed up and it's their fault. So if you're using a list like that, you need to make sure that that list has supposedly scrubbed the uh, do not call. If you're just calling on your own, you need to be aware of the law that you can't call somebody unless you have a business relationship with that person over the last year, if they're on the do not call list without being potentially subject to a lawsuit. And there are people out there who make their living filing lawsuits because they that's what they do. They just sit for their cell phone, wait, wait, wait for, the, for their cell phone to ring. And then they file a do not call uh, action. And it's the same kind of problem as with the ADA compliance, where once you make the mistake, it's kind of hard to do anything but settle it. Um, the third one I wanted to make, they're all kind of in the same line. The third one has to do with copyrighted pictures. So when you're dealing with pictures, you shouldn't be using pictures that you just find off the internet unless you find them off of an internet site, which says that these pictures are public domain and they're not copyrighted. So you shouldn't be using Getty images. You shouldn't be using uh, a previous listing agent's photos because uh, those all are subject to lawsuits for copyright infringement. And once you get one of those, you're stuck with either having to settle it um, or going to court on those. And those aren't pleasant either. <clears throat> so the moral of the story there is when you're dealing with photos, either use your own photos or use a photo that where you where you uh, got a photographer and there's a CAR form that you can have filled out by the photographer and by you, which says exactly what you or the photographer can do with those photos. Or the photographer may have his own form that he uses, which explains that he's giving you a license to use them or whatever the scenario is. Don't just randomly use pictures. We've had any number of lawsuits uh, threatened or filed when people just use pictures off of the internet. And again, there are photographers out there who make their living not taking good photos, but just taking photos that they copyright and then just wait for somebody to use them and file a lawsuit. And there are law firms out there that are just mills for that. That's all they do is, is file those complaints and try to settle them for whatever they can settle them for. The Getty Images, you're, you're probably, probably all familiar with Getty Images. They tend to be the easiest ones to settle for the least amount of money uh, just because they'll settle them because there's so many. But when you get a private photographer, those attorneys want more. We've had to settle some of those for $5,000, $7,500, whatever. So those are the three areas I wanted to, to mention uh, with regard to uh, risk management. Um, on another a separate note, it's, it's you know, the market is changing now. Obviously, we don't have as many buyers writing uh, non-contingent offers as we did maybe three, four, five months ago. Uh, but still, I wanted to emphasize that, that waiving uh, contingencies, especially the contingency on the investigation and inspection of the property is always a terrible idea. If, if your buyer wants to waive the loan contingency or the appraisal contingency because they know 100% they can get the loan or they know they have the cash to make up the difference if the appraisal comes in low, that's their decision. And you still should use that form, that new form, uh, because there are certainly risks that the appraisal might come in too low or they might not get their loan. But waiving the investigation and the inspection contingency is just an awful thing to do because the seller may disclose everything they know, but they may not know that there's a foundation problem, which might have been discovered with an inve inspection. They may not know that there's a problem with sewer, which may have been discovered with a sewer inspection. So if they're going to waive those, you absolutely should be using that form, which is an advisement to them that you do, you are, they're acting against the broker's advice. Um, it, it protects you. And also, if you're a listing agent, just a piece of advice, I've heard this many times before. If you're a listing agent and an offer comes in with no investigation contingency, I personally, as a listing agent, would talk to the seller and say, you know what, this isn't really, this sounds like it's good for you because they're waiving this. This isn't good for you because if there's a problem later on, they're going to sue everybody. So do yourself a favor and counter back in their right to an investigation contingency for what, you know, short time, five days or whatever. And that way you've countered it back in. And then if there's a problem, you can say, hey, look, I gave them every chance to do an investigation and an inspection of the property. It's just a bad idea to go through an, an, a deal without an inspection of the property. Um, so so I wanted to, to uh, mention that. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to 
cover. I have a question. I have a question regarding that. Good. Uh, so if a buyer were to sign off on an inspection waiver, uh, you can still turn around after close of escrow and have a successful loss. Well, here, here's the deal. No matter what the buyer signs off on, they can still file a lawsuit and they can find a plaintiff's attorney who will sue everybody. Doesn't mean they'll be successful. And the more pieces of paper you have telling a buyer not to do it and that they're acting against your advice, you might get involved in a lawsuit because you'll get some plaintiff's attorney that sues everybody, but you're going to have your defense. So the more things they sign saying, don't do this, the better off you are. Did that, does that answer your question? In a way, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, any other uh, questions um, regarding uh, any of the issues or any other risk management uh, general questions that you have? How's the weather at the beach? One, one, more, one more thing I'll mention, because uh, this comes up fairly regularly, is, is uh, selling properties out of state so or out of the country. So you shouldn't be selling properties out of the state or out of the country. You don't have E&O insurance that's going to cover that. So let's say you get a, a call from a broker in uh, <clears throat> Idaho or whatever, Kansas, and or, or you have a client who wants you to list a property in Kansas or Idaho. Don't list it. You don't have E&O insurance for that. You're not licensed in that state. Uh, there are ways that you could actually co-list a property in another state with an, uh, an in-state brokerage. There, all the different states have different rules. But you don't want to do that because you don't have E&O coverage. You want to, what you want to do is refer them to that broker and get a referral fee. If you get a referral fee and you're not on any other paperwork, you have no liability. If you become a co-listing broker on a property in another country, another state, you've got potential liability not only for what you do wrong, but what the other agent might do wrong because you're a co-listing broker. So even though you're allowed to be a co-listing broker in some states with a, a, an in-state brokerage, you do, you do not want to do that. It's, there's too much liability and there's no E&O insurance on that. So just refer it. You can get whatever referral fee you want. You get a 50% referral fee if you want to. Uh, just refer it. Let them do all that. You can do the work behind the scenes, but keep your name off of the paperwork other than the uh, referral or free agreement. Okay. Jeff, uh, Jeff talk, yeah. talk about agents doing open houses for other brokerages. Oh, okay. Um, so this is, a, this is kind of a hot topic that's been discussed at CAR with the CAR attorneys over and over and over again over the last few months. So here's the, the bottom line. The bottom line is that if you do a, an open house for another brokerage, or another brokerage does an open house for you, there are several legal and ethical problems potentially with that. The first problem is that you may not have E&O coverage. If you do a, an open house for another brokerage, and let's say somebody, let's say there's money stolen, uh, somebody falls down. We had one where somebody left the water on and the house, you know, was left alone and, and it leaked like there were two feet, I mean, whatever, it was terrible. All these things can happen on an open house. If you hold another brokerage's open house open, your insurance, your E&O insurance and your general liability insurance might say, you know what? You weren't acting on behalf of your own brokerage. You were holding an open house for another brokerage. We're not going to cover you. Same thing if, you, if another broker holds your open house. Um, you may not have insurance coverage. That's a huge problem. Um, that's the first problem. The second problem is, by holding an open house for another brokerage or vice versa, you may be giving a, this is a lesser of a problem, but it's still a problem. You may be giving a false impression to the public who you represent. If you're sitting on an open house for uh, ABC Realty uh, and, a, and an agent comes in, they will think that you're the broker for the seller because you're sitting there. And if you don't have something that disclaims that, you could have a problem later on with a DRE investigation that you didn't disclose to the public that you weren't representing the seller, blah, 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 blah. So for, for many, it, it is, so DIR, DRE has also come out with a regulation. It is not illegal to do it. So I want to make it clear. It's not illegal to do this. It is, however, not recommended at all because of the E&O and general liability potential for lack of coverage. And while 99% of the properties do not have a problem at open houses, the 1% that do, our problem. And we do have several with Keller Williams now. We have one that just came up in another office where something was stolen out of the house. Uh, but fortunately, the agent held the open house themselves. But if it had been an agent from another company, or if our agent had held it for another company, there may not have been insurance to cover that. Um, and, and that's the 
you know, we, there was one, and I, I forget what office it was, but there was one where there was a flood in the property. Like somebody left the water on and it flooded the, and it was a condo and it flooded the property. It flooded the unit below that. It was a major catastrophe. And it was a property where they, they, somebody was holding it open for another brokerage. And so the insurance company denied coverage. So it's a mess. So Rich, did I scare him enough on that or? Thank you, yes. <laughs> Jen, I have a question. Good. Are we allowed to write our own offers and purchase our own properties? Um, so in other words, are you allowed to act as a principal on your own property? Right, as a buyer. Yeah, you, that 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 legally you can. That's up to Keller Williams to 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 say yes, you can do it or not. But you need to be aware of the fact that if as a buyer, whether you write it as a principal or whether you write it through uh, Keller Williams as the brokerage, there's no E and O coverage on that anyway. E and O coverage doesn't generally cover uh, buyers who act as principal agents who act as principals and, and the purchase side. On the listing side, there is generally coverage, but on the buyer side, you don't have coverage generally. Um, so whether you can write an offer is up to the brokerage to tell you you can do it or you can't do it, but it's, there's, it's not a legal issue. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. That, that I, I just want to reiterate too. So like a lot of people think, oh, so like Susie, I'll have Christine write for me because I'll, then I'll have be covered on E&O, but it doesn't matter. It's just the broker. No, no, most, yeah, yeah. Most of the, now you'd have to check with your own E&O policy just to make sure, but most E&O policies just don't cover, uh, agents who act as principals, whether they're representing themselves or somebody else in the same brokerage is representing them. So if it doesn't cover now, if you, now, if you, if you listed it with another brokerage, the other brokerage would have, you know, insurance that would cover them, you know, you wouldn't be covered as a principal, but they'd have, you know, insurance covering themselves as a brokerage. As a buyer. As a buyer. So it's okay or not? I don't understand. You just won't have, you know, insurance. Right. I mean, you're not going to see yourself. Right. But if you but if you see the seller, you'll you'll have to. You would have to come out of pocket for your legal representation. Right. As a buyer, so as a buyer, as buyer. Yeah. Thank you. You know, keep keep in mind that keep in mind that on the buyer side, uh, you generally don't have you know claims. I mean, you know claims generally come when a buyer sues the seller for non-disclosure or whatever. On the buyer side, you usually don't have claims other than you might have a claim for the deposit, but that's not something that E&O would cover. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Rich or Stephanie, is there anything else you wanted me to cover? No, that's good. Thank you so much. Okay. Well. Yeah. Really appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. And I know that we'll be setting up time, Ken, uh, next year. We'll be doing a lot of risk management, so on and so forth, more so than we had before. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and the good news is, now that I've done this, I won't hear from any of you for at least 60 days. <laughs> <laughs> right, Rich? Right, Rich? Right, Rich? <laughs> okay, Rich, I'm sure I'll be talking to you later today. <laughs> exactly. Okay, you, everybody have a good Christmas, a good, uh, good Hanukkah or whatever you're celebrating and a good holiday season. Thank All right, you. thank you. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye. All right. You know we always go over, right? So it's it's awesome, but it's it's imperative, right? It's, it's priceless information, et cetera. Okay, so let's hurry up and um, blast through this. Let's see. Okay. Book club. <laughs> right. I'm not saying you guys, I have allergies. That's my voice. <clears throat> so we pushed this one because there was too many uh, illnesses for the last one. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have pushed Paul's book until January 17th. The new schedule will be coming out for the new year, but that will be on um, the first one. And um, I'm also um, asking that if anybody has a request for a book that we would consider for the next following year, would you please privately send me a text or give me a call? Mm -hmm. um, I have a pretty good list going, but I would like to add things that you guys want to want to um, hear about. So, um, and there are still some books available. Paul was very gracious and gave us more than our allotted 10 that we usually give out. So I'm hoping to make this one a huge one. Great. So, All right. Thank you so much. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Christine, for doing that. Yes, she's continuing to be our book club ambassador yeah. for 2023. So I really appreciate all your all your time and effort. Oh. Okay. Why is it not going? There we go. Okay, you guys know about the 20 our email program. Da 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 reminder, we have a calabasas.info site that has our calendar on it.
Oh, I clicked on it. I'm like, what the hell did I just do? Okay. Um, birthdays. Happy birthday, December baby. All y'all. And then happy anniversaries to everybody. You see, I changed. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Do you get a kick out of that? So happy anniversary in Keller Williams land. Appreciate it. November closings 2022. Congratulations. One of our uh you know slower months and look at all the people that still closed a deal. So really appreciate each and every one of you, all your hard work and keep going. You have to make this like two minutes. Okay. I'll talk as fast as I can. Like a minute or less. So there you go. Okay, great. So um you probably noticed that there's just not everybody out there who's buying or thought about buying and have decided to wait. But wait for what? I mean, if you ask me is now a good time, you know, I'd be lying if I said it's an ideal time to buy. But is it a bad time to buy? As Stephanie loves to say, it depends. But um, for the most part, I want to point out on this chart here, I don't wonder if I can use this thing. So on this first chart up here, the red line represents rents and the blue line represents mortgage payments. So we're going through a little bit of an unusual time where normally rent payments are a bit above mortgage payments, but when rates are at their highest, that goes out of whack, which is where we are right now. And that's not only causing an additional slowdown in terms of people wanting to buy, but it's a blip in time because think of it logically, um, people aren't going to buy investment properties unless they cash flow. So that's why typically rents are going to be a little bit higher than the housing payment. But right now they're not. But if we zoom forward over to this um, chart, this is the house values from like the early 70s to present. And the gray bars are recession periods. And as you can see, the value of properties just continues to march onward and upward. And in fact, what the data is showing us, and, and I, what I think is really important here is not just for us to understand this, but for us to be able to talk to our clients about what's going on in the market right now. So what this is showing is that property values continue to rise. Real estate is the only asset class that has only crashed once in the last 15 years. It's pretty phenomenal. And that was during this recessionary period. And look where we are today, uh, certainly recovered. Your mortgage balances will always eventually go down. You'll either pay them down, pay them off, refinance them, recast them, whatever. But you're, uh, and you, so you'll have opportunities to lower your payments over time. If you're renting, however, your rent, rent payments are perpetual. You, and they're typically going to always be higher than the mortgage rates. So rents um, don't go away. Mortgage payments can go away eventually. Rates, yes, they're higher now than they have been, but rates are temporary. They go up and down all the time. So there will be opportunities over time for you to capture a better rate and potentially refinance. Uh, values, they they keep going strong. So um, if you're waiting, you might just be missing out on a lot of opportunity for to start your uh, getting the benefits of home ownership. And then lastly, I wanted to talk through some of today's opportunities, which <laughs> we were kind of straight from the bottom of the barrel there, looking for things that are good in this market in terms of uh, mortgage. But, you know, if you can offer buy downs, um, uh, if your client is in a position where they have to pay mortgage insurance because they're paying, they're putting less than 20% down, you, um, it might be in their best interest financially to just pay that mortgage insurance all up front. And that could even be paid by a seller potentially. And then uh, that'll save them hundreds of dollars on their monthly payment. If the seller's loan is assumable, great. That might be a potential option. And HELOCs, hot, hot, hot HELOCs. Because now that um, rates are low and nobody's refinancing, 
we're looking for things to do. So now we're do, we're offering HELOCs and people want to use them because they don't want to dip into those nice low mortgages. So if you have somebody who's looking to move up, get them a HELOC and then they have money to put down on their next home. And then lastly, don't forget about the 50 plus the seniors out there who can do reverse mortgages. Um, they can buy with a reverse mortgage. That just means they're going to be putting 50% or more down payment. And then with that mortgage, they'll have a new mortgage. That's all. We thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Philip, later. <laughs> thank you. Calabas, <laughs> Cedro. We keep opening every single week. Super excited. You guys are doing amazing. 2023 family reunion in Anaheim, February 18th to the 21st. Uh, don't have sticker shock. It's going to be fun. That's our calendar. We're going to skip that. We're done. Okay. <laughs> Those of you, thank you all for hanging in there. It's important, important information. I love what we have. The opportunity to have Jeff Con. Um, we're just going to have to go through stuff, some stuff later. But I need all the sweater babies. <laughs> Okay, so we can vote on you. Everybody who wants to be in the thing. Thank you all. Bye, Cheers. Cheers.